Okay, so today we're going to move into our speech sound learning and disorders in children. So this is page 123 to 164 in the fifth edition of the textbook. It's chapter 5. Uh, today we're going to talk about what is speech or articulation, define the different components of articulation that are used for the measurement and analysis of speech and speech language pathology. Um, we'll talk about how we classify speech sounds, how speech is developed, um, and then speech sound disorders. So the differences between types of speech sound disorders, the causes of speech sound disorders, and how we assess those. So this should look pretty familiar at this point. So today we're really just specifically talking about the articulatory component of oral communication. So we're breaking down our language into an even smaller part. So if we look at it this way, we can see that verbal communication can be broken down into phrases and sentences, into words, into syllables, and then finally into speech sounds. So when we talk about speech, we're really talking about articulation and speech language pathology. And articulation is very simply just the movement of anatomical parts. So if we're looking at uh, how our, we move our fingers from our joints uh, at the end of our fingers to our knuckle on our hand, we can change the way that we hold a pencil. Well, the same is true for the movements of our speech structures. So how I move my tongue to create the sound duh versus the sound guh. Um, that is an articulatory movement. So when we talk about articulation, it is very simply just the movement and how we shape sounds. So another way to look at it, for those of you that kind of like different visuals, we can start from the bottom with respiration, right? It's kind of our su support for oral communication because it provides our air so that we can get our voice or our phonation through that production of sound. As we produce sound, that sound bounces around through our cavities, and then once it gets up to the mouth, we can shape the sounds or articulate those sounds, putting those sounds together, giving them meaning, um, providing a message with that is language. So language encompasses speech or includes speech, um, but it's not specifically speech. And we've talked about that before, how we have verbal and nonverbal language. Language can occur without speech. Um, and speech can occur without language, but it doesn't quite have the same meaning or the same effect without language. So this is also something from the previous lectures, and when we talk about speech sound disorders, we're going to talk about the structural or anatomic, which is really our articulation disorders. We're going to talk about our phonetic, uh, or the concrete productions, which is also under our articulation disorders. We're also going to talk about our phonemic um, or phonological disorders, so the disorders of um, those that affect the smallest meaning of sound or a uh, unit of sound. And in last class, we talked about our motoric, our dysarthria and apraxia. So one thing I want you to keep in mind as we're going through this lecture and how to tell the difference between our motoric and our other speech sound disorders, so our motor speech disorders versus our speech sound disorders, articulation and phonology, is that our motor speech disorders are generally caused by damage to the brain or the nerves, so the CNS and the PNS. For articulation and phonological disorders, they're more often in children, um, and they are developmental disorders. So there's no known cause, meaning that it's idiopathic. So um, when we talk about articulation, again, it's just shaping the sound waves into specific sounds. Um, so an example of that is providing a burst of air and a closure of the lips as we voice. So I close my lips. I turn my sound bite bo box on and I make the sound b. I can change that sound by moving my tongue to my alveolar ridge and I'll still have a burst of air, I'll still turn on my voice and I'll make the sound d. And then if I do a flow of air and put my tongues on the side of my palate and turn on my voice, I can make the sound z. So if you listen to the difference between b and z is that we have a burst of air versus a flow of air. We can also manipulate speech sounds by turning our voice off and on. So if I make the sound z with my voice, I can also make the sound s without my voice. That is articulation, manipulating those sounds to make different um, speech sounds or phonemes.
when we talk about articulation, we have to have common language and common rules. Um, so in order to do that, we have kind of two different perspectives, and that's where all of these fancy definitions come in. We have the linguistics perspective where they're really looking at how we use speech sounds, how we create sounds, how we use them, how we get the meaning behind them, how they're interpreted. From a speech pathology standpoint, it's a little bit different. We're looking at how the rules of the language affect speech sounds and how they're produced. So either the productions meet or don't meet the rules of the language. Um, so in speech pathology we have a, a subsection and this kind of crosses over with linguistics known as phonology. And that is just the scientific study of the sound system and the patterns of the language. So phonology just tells us what's legal and what's illegal in a language. So, for instance, in the English language, we have a rule that says that three consonants can go uh, in a row. But it has a stipulation because we can have that rule where STR is a legal, legal production of three consonants in a row for the word street. But we can't use SRT, three consonants in a row, to produce a, a word because it violates the rules of our language. And so phonology really varies depending on the language that you're observing, which is why it's important when we talk about speech sound production in children that they're really producing those sounds within the rules of their language and not within the rules of someone else's language. Um, so when we break that down, we have different ways of looking at it. So we have graphemes, which are just printed letters. So that's what you're reading right now. When we transcribe speech, we write down graphemes. Um, and phones are just the production of sound. Now that sound doesn't matter if it is meaningful to that specific language. It is very simply just sound production. Um, when we write down that transcription of sound production, then we put that in brackets. Um, but what we're actually looking at as speech pathologists is the phonetic production, so how the actual sounds are produced. When the child produces those sounds, um, what do they come out as? And then how are they perceived? So the phonetic production is the child producing the sounds. The phonemic production is how we interpret those sounds, how we hear those sounds. So if you're in the um, phonetics class, you have to do transcription. So you listen to someone talking and then you write down the productions of those sounds, right? So when we're using that in context, we have the phonetic production is what you're listening to, the phonemic transcription is what you're writing down, and what you're writing down is actually graphemes. Okay? Um, and then we break that down into phonemes. So phonemes are just the uh, smallest unit of sound that if they're swapped with another phoneme can affect the meaning. So this goes back into phonology uh, and tells us the rules for the language, right? What's right, what's not right, and how we violate those rules or use them correctly. And then we have allophones, which are just variations of phonemes. So within our language, we have the word or the letter k um, or k, and it can change the way that we perceive that by how we produce it as well as how it is used. So for the um, phonetic production of key versus cool, it changes the uh, movements of the articulators to accommodate for the vowel that comes after that phony. Okay? Um, and that is more of a speech pathology perspective. We also have more of a linguistics perspective, which says that from the English language we have the letter C, right? And C can be produced as an S or a K. Um, and so underneath that language we have to transcribe that into phonemes um, or the phonemic interpretation of that sound depending on how it's produced. What that really tells us is that we have a problem with the alphabet, right? Because if we have a, the letter C that can have multiple productions, we have to be able to write that down or transcribe it so that we can have a common language, right? So for many languages, it's not just specifically the English language, we have a letter of the alphabet that stands for multiple sounds. 
So in English we have 26 letters, but we have 46 sounds. And sounds can change over time. Um, and we also have to consider that not only do we have more sounds than letters, but we also have useless letters. So, for instance, a useless letter is a Q. No one actually says Q. You don't go queen, queen, right? It's actually a combination of phonemes. Um, so we actually put two phonemes together, a K and a W, a K, W, to give us the Q sound, right? And then we also put other sounds together, like in rendezvous, we don't say rendezvous, right? Um, or when we write out the word boot, we put two O's, but we don't actually go boot. So what they've come up with is the International Phonetic Alphabet. So this alphabet just contains separate phonemes for each sound that we have in the English language. And it's not just the English language, it's every language. There are lots and lots of phonemes out there. Um, but it's a set of symbols essentially that represents most sounds. And each symbol represents only one sound or one phoneme. Um, so there's a table in your textbooks. This is from um, the fourth edition. Uh, you might have to find it in the fifth edition. Um, but essentially when you look over here on the far right where we have the consonants, the consonants are a little bit easier to learn than the vowels, but even then there are some challenging ones. Um, and the consonants are easy because most of them reflect uh, what we already know in the English language. So the ones that are probably a little bit trippy are the ones that don't quite line up. So for instance, we have sing and finger. Um, so we give our in a little bit of a hook and that kind of gives us that backward sound that tells us the ng sound versus the n sound. And that might be a little bit clearer when I talk to you in class. Um, and then we have other consonants that are a little bit different. So we have S, which is S, right? Just the pure S sound. But we also have a SH. And so we have an, a longer S here on the side that gives us the SH sound. Now if we combined SH with our vowel over here, this small E, or I, um, then we can get the word SHE. So she is only made with two phonemes, even though it's made with three graphemes. All right, so when we're talking about classifying the speech sounds using the IPA, um, we talk about breaking them down into vowels and consonants, right? And we know what vowels are, we know what co consonants are. Um, but it, how we determine those from a, a speech production standpoint is how the vocal tract changes. So vowels um, is, are produced with an open vocal tract and we modify vowels using our tongue and our lips. We primarily list vowels based on tongue position um, and then the aid of lip rounding. When we're talking about consonants, it's where we have constriction in the oral cavity and how we change that level of, of constriction determines the consonant that we're producing. So we label consonants according to their place, their manner, and their voicing. So again, vowels are classified according to the tongue position, whether the tongue is more forward, met, where it, or it's more in the middle um, or further in the back, if it's high in the mouth, kind of arched up, if it's a little bit flatter, or if it's actually kind of tucked low. And then for the lips, whether the lips are round or not. Um, and con uh, vowels are always voiced, and that's gonna contrast to consonants where they can be voiced or voiceless. Um, vowels are always voiced. So if I go from down here at the bottom, this all sound, aw sound to an o sound, right? O is still a back vowel like ah, but now my lips are a little bit rounded and then my tongue is a uh, more higher mid uh, placement in my mouth. So it's a little bit flat, um, but it's not as flat as an uh. And then we have our high vowels. Our high front vowel is an E. So if you make an E with your um, mouth, you can feel that the tongue comes up. So it's high in the mouth. And then it's also a little bit more forward advanced. And our lips are not rounded. They're actually very flat. 
Um, so vowels are typically produced with a singular production, um, but they can also be combined. When you combine two vowels pr together, you create a diphthong, um, which just means that you have a continuous change in the vocal tract. So it's kind of a, a curve between two vowels. So when you look at this, the word cow, you're actually getting this O and this U, these two back vowels um, placed together. When you're doing boy, you're doing two vowels together. Again, you have this O here and then this high front E um, here, and the tongue just kind of curves forward. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going B O E. You have that continuous movement that gives you boy. So if we overlay the tongue, that should help you just a little bit where you see that outline. We have the front of the tongue here, we have the body of the tongue, um, and then we have the back. Uh, when we're talking about the consonants, we have that constriction in the oral cavity where that air is flowing through the glottis, right? It comes and resonates through the pharynx, through the oral cavity, and then we're providing that constriction um, with the front of the tongue to produce a sound. So depending on where the um, constriction occurs is the place. The degree or type of constriction is our manner, so that's how the air flows through that constriction. And then the voicing is just the presence or absence of the vocal fold vibrations. So when we break down the place, we have bilabial, labiodental, dental, alveolar, palatal, velar, and glottal placement. So that's, again, where the constriction occurs. So bilabial, labial is lips, it just means that both lips come together. These are sounds like p, b, m, and w. So if we look at the difference between a p and a b, we can determine by deleting that little vowel that likes to hang around whether it's voiced or voiceless. So these are um, phonological pairs. So p is a voiceless sound, b is a voiced sound, right? And if you put your hand on your throat, you can feel the difference. If you go p, p versus b, okay? Uh, labiodental, we have the lips and the teeth come together, and those are our sounds and v. So put your hand on your throat, make the F sound. You can feel that that's voiceless. And if you make the v sound, you can feel that that's voiced. And then you can read through the rest of these um, to figure out which ones are dental, alveolar, palatal, velar, or glottal. Okay, when we talk about the manner, that's the degree or type of it constriction. So this is how that air changes within the uh, vocal tract. So we have stops, fricatives, affricates, glides, liquids or semivowels, and nasals. So stops or plosives are where we have a buildup of pressure and then it's released in a small explosion. So that's how we get our plosives. So if you put your hand in front of your lips and go p or b, you can feel a little puff of air come out. If you put your hand in front of your lips and you go s or z or sh, you can feel a continuous flow of air. So it gives us more of our hissing sound. Those are fricatives. Affricates are a combination between a stop and a fricative. So this is our ch sound, right? If you put your hand in front of your lips, you can feel ch, a little bit of a burst of air as well as a little continuation of air. Another way to remember the difference between a stop and a fricative is that you can't make stops keep going. So if you try and hold out a p sound as long as you can, it's not going to work, right? It's going to last a half a second. But if you could try and hold out an s sound as long as you can, it keeps going. Affricates are a little bit of an in-between. We can go ch and extend how long that beginning sound is, but we can't keep it going for very long, so that's our affricates. Glides are a gradual change from one uh, place in the articulation uh, shape to another. So if we go with w, our lips start rounded and then they slowly fall, and that gives a w sound. The same with y, we start with our, our mouth and our tongue tight and closed and then it falls very gradually. Um, our liquids are more like vowels, um, and so it's really changing the shape of the tongue. Um, and our liquids are a little bit tricky in terms of placement because some people produce liquids a little bit differently depending on how they learn them. Um, so our liquids are er and ol, or R and L.
And then nasals, um, remember this is the degree or type of constriction, meaning that the air flows through the nasal cavity. So our velopharyngeal port, our velo velum and our pharynx aren't contacting all the way, so that sound passes through to the nose. And that gives us our m, mm, n, mm, and ng sounds. And you know that it's a nasal if you put your hand on your, or your finger on your nose, and as you make mmm, you should feel the outside of your nose vibrate. Versus when you say uh, d, you're not going to feel the outside of your nose vibrate. So when we talk about how sound or speech sounds are acquired, we have speech pattern acquisition. So the stages of speech sound acquisition also uh, kind of mimics language acquisition. So think about it, an infant. We're not born speaking, we're not born um, using oral language, but that infant develops the language and that communication over time. And so we talked about before cooing and babbling. So cooing starts around three months and that's where they have various vowel sounds and they're really just playing around with those articulators. So we've viewed this from a language perspective where cooing is a communication of vocal play um, with the infant versus the caregiver. And now we're looking at it from a speech perspective where we're working with those articulators and strengthening them and working on the coordination. So think about for cooing, we're putting vowels together that are forwards and backwards, high and low, our lips are rounded or flat, um, and we're also playing around with the voice. When they move into five to seven months old, they have more recognizable speech sounds, and this is where mom and dad really start listening for mama or dada, right? Um, but from a speech sound perspective, we're looking at how those speech sounds are put together from simplest to hardest, essentially. The things that are more recognizable, easy to see from the front of the mouth uh, or the front of the tongue, um, and those that are easy to hear. So our speech sounds also kind of mimic our language production because the easy to say speech sounds are more likely to be interpreted as words in those early productions. So if we look at this chart over on the right, we have our ages um, up at the top, which is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we talked about around age 1, we start getting first words, which means by age 2, all of the sounds p, b, h, n, w, and b should be fully established. As they advance into 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, you're getting more and more uh, challenging with those sounds and more and more approximations. So if we look a little bit further over at the 3-year mark, um, into the 4-year mark, we have R, L, and S. R and L are very, very challenging sounds because they're hard to see. So R and L is made a little bit different um, depending on person to person and how they learn to place the tongue in the mouth. Um, and so when we're looking at this development chart and the acquisition of those sounds, it doesn't mean that a four-year-old should have a perfect production of R and L, but it does mean that they have uh, the approximation of it. So you can see if you continue over in the chart for R, it really starts by age four and then continues on to seven and a half. So by seven and a half they should really have that true adult production of R. And by uh, age six we should have a true production of L. But it should appear in the productions uh, of speech sounds as early as age three or four. Um, and that's going to be important as we go into speech sound disorders and how we evaluate them. So when we talk about speech sound disorders, we're going to talk about two different types and focus in on those. But I want you to keep in mind speech sound development and how speech sound development really impacts how we evaluate children. One of the things we're looking at for speech sound disorders is overall speech intelligibility. So I said before, when we're measuring speech sounds, we're measuring whether or not they're produced to um, match or violate the, the rules of the language or the rules of the speech sounds within the language. So if you remember back to that chart, I said the R's and the L's are a little bit more challenging. The same is true if we combine speech sounds together. So when we go back to our rule of three consonants in a row, 
the three consonants str are actually very challenging to produce in a row because we go from s, which is our fricatives, to a t, which is a stop with the front of our tongue, to a er, which is more of a mid-back sound, um, and then to a high e vowel, and then another plosive t. So thinking about that as a three-year-old, and coordinating all of those sounds together, you may do something to make it a little bit simpler, which is known as a phonological process. So phonological processes are just patterns of simplified productions of adult speech sounds. And that can be through omission, where you delete certain parts of the speech sounds, or substitute parts of the speech sounds. So if you think about the word street, if you're substituting, you might say street. Right? It's a little bit easier because you're not throwing your tongue way back in your mouth, you're just changing the shape of your lips. If you omit part of it, then you can say treat or seat, and it makes it an even simpler production. Um, and so phonological processes are a typical part of speech development um, because it's helping the child simplify the, the speech into a way that they can use it while still providing the same uh, sound classes or categories. Um, so when we're talking about speech sound disorders and evaluating them, we can identify a child's phonological processes. So if phonological processes are essentially just the rules that the, that the child comes up with on their own to uh, help them meet the expectations of the speech rules in the language. Now, the phonological processes are important when we talk about intelligibility because the more speech uh, or phonological processes you have, the less intelligible you are. So if you're substituting or emitting more and more sounds in a, in a production, you're going to be able to understand less and less as a, a listener. I want you to think back to the phonological processes of R. If we have a child who is eight years old, remember on our chart, seven was kind of the maybe eight, um, the age range where we expect adult-like productions. So if the child is eight or nine years old and still producing a W for an R, so they're still saying sweet instead of street, um, we start to become concerned as to why. And in some cases, we know that there is a cause or an etiology. In other cases, we don't know that there is a, a true cause or an etiology, meaning that it's idiopathic. So if we look on the, the left side of this screen, we have more of the idiopathic causes. And they're not so much causes so, at, so much as um, co-occurrences. So children who have these types of um, characteristics are more likely to have speech sound disorders with an idiopathic um, etiology than those that don't. So children who have very low intelligence or low uh, socioeconomic status who are males uh, who have a delay in their language development or if they are a younger sibling are more likely to have speech sound disorders than those who don't. That doesn't mean that they have anything else going on with them. Um, but they're just more at risk for it. And that goes back into our language discussion of children who are talked to less frequently um, or are having trouble understanding the rules of language can also have difficulty understanding the rules of sounds. If we look at the right side of the screen, these are the ones that are kind of the known causes. And it can be related to our structure, um, any condition related to structure or intelligence. Uh, it can also be based on uh, sensory impairments uh, or motor based. So the structurally based are anything that changes the anatomical structure of the articulators. So that's our cleft palate or craniofacial anomalies and we'll talk about those more in our cleft palate lecture. Uh, it can also be related to a syndrome or other condition. So for example, Down syndrome, uh, it can be related to the um, structure of the jaw and the mouth or how the tongue is um, a little bit more flaccid or loose in the mouth, um, giving it more of a dysarthric quality. It can also be related to intelligence. So Down syndrome gen generally has uh, a lower intelligence level and so they have more likely, uh, more like are more likely to have difficulty with speech sounds and learning the rules of speech sounds. Uh, then it can also be related to hearing. If you can't hear the sounds, then you're going to have trouble producing those sounds, and it has to do with that auditory feedback loop. 
Um, and then you have the motor based, which is more what we talked about before, uh, where the uh, signal from the brain isn't going down uh, into the uh, articulators. Now, thinking of the etiologies, uh, we have to think about how the speech sound disorder is uh, produced. So there are two different ways that you can have difficulty learning or producing sounds in a language. Now, it can be an articulation disorder related to the production of the speech sounds, and that is very simply just the movement of the articulators. Are they getting to the right spot? Um, or a phonological disorder which affects the underlying rules of the language, and it goes back into our phonological processes and grouping those uh, errors in production together. So for errors in articulation, these are really, again, individual errors where you're affecting the uh, specific speech sounds within that production. And sometimes it's consistent and sometimes it's not. Um, and it's just essentially the, the articulators, the tongue, the lips, the teeth are not moving in coordination or they're not reaching their full potential. Um, so you can omit certain speech sounds, uh, substitute, distort, or add speech sounds and have articulation errors. Um, and so if you think about someone who has um, a gap between their teeth or they're missing their two front teeth, they're going to have a, a lisp, right? Kind of that th sound because the air is just flowing through a wide open space that's not a typically wide open open space. That's an articulation error. It's really related more to the structure, not so much of the underlying rules. In contrast, for the errors of phonology, that's really the patterns um, or the processes of the errors. So they're a little bit more consistent, um, and it is m more of, just like with language, we have those underlying rules for the language. For speech sounds, we have those underlying rules. If we violate those rules um, and create new patterns, then we have phonological errors. So there are much more of those. Um, we have a penthesis where you're adding in an additional sound. It's typically that uh sound. So they might say spoon instead of spoon or Noah for no or wheel for will. There's also reduplication and that's just taking um, one syllable and repeating it again and again. So instead of bottle it's baba for Charlotte it's cha cha. For cone it's cone cone. For brother it's bubba. Uh, initial consonant deletion, you're taking off the initial consonant from the beginning of the word. So instead of soap, it's ope. Deep, it's eep. Got, it's ought. And then in, uh, the opposite end of that, you can have final consonant deletion where you're deleting the end of the word. So instead of house, it's how. Uh, some, it's su. Uh, or book, it's bu. And then there's unstressed syllable deletion, where it can more typically occur in the middle of the word. So this is telephone instead of telephone, ba ball instead of basketball, or effunt instead of elephant. Uh, there's denasalization, where the, um, the sounds that should be nasalized aren't. So instead of man, they might say made. Uh, instead of mad, they say bad. Instead of nice they say dice and you notice with nice and dice mad and bad um, mad and man the placement is all the same but the sound isn't sent through the nose so say mad and then say man you'll feel that the tongue is in the same place but your the uh, airflow or the sound flow through the nose versus through the mouth changes Cluster reduction uh, is where they delete part of the consonant cluster. So instead of train, see we have here a consonant T and R in the beginning. They might say tain. Uh, they could have boo instead of blue with the two consonants or mel instead of uh, smell. For fronting, that's moving sounds that were originally uh, produced in the back to the front. So got, g is a sound produced in the back of the mouth. If they produce dot, d is produced in the front of the mouth, that's fronting. Um, for come, k is produced in the back of the mouth, t 
is produced in the front of the mouth, and so that's fronting. Um, you'll notice that with these rules, the voicing stays the same. So if they are trying to say got, they're not going to say tot. They're going to say dot because it's still a voiced sound. It's usually just the placement that's affected, not so much the manner. So now moving on to the anatomy, this goes back into our articulation disorders. Are the structures affected so that they can't reach their full potential? They can't meet the, the movements that they need to make. So going back into the anatomy of articulation, we have the lips and the cheeks, the jaw, the teeth, the tongue, the hard palate, and then the two parts of the hard palate, right? The alveolar ridge and then the hard palate, the soft palate or the velum, and then the glottis. For errors in articulation, they can have um, problems with the anatomy that affect that articulation. So for the jaw, they could have retronathia, where the jaw is very small and set back, and so that it looks like the teeth, the top teeth almost protrude over the bottom jaw. If you look at the side profile, uh, the jaw is actually set very far back from the uh, top teeth. Uh, for teeth, there's also malocclusion. So remember we talked about in the anatomy lecture how the teeth line up in the mouth. This is less likely to cause articulation uh, errors than something like retronathia um, or mi micronathia or where it's a small jaw. Um, and But it's just something to consider. Uh, then there is uh, for the tongue something called ankyloglossia or tongue tie. This is where the frenum underneath the tongue is very short. Um, and so they say in some studies that uh, if the tongue is too short to reach the top of the mouth or lift off of the floor of the mouth, then they'll have difficulty producing specific sounds. Um, but in reality, this is very uncommon. Um, lots of people have tongue ties and um, have no difficulty with articulation. Um, so it's something to consider, but it's not always a cause. And then in the hard and soft palate, you can have a cleft palate where there's an opening in the roof of the mouth. And so you just can't create that seal that you need to to produce certain sounds. Um, and then uh, you also have the glottis if something's going on with the glottis, uh, if there's uh, trouble creating sound um, to produce speech sounds, then you can also have other uh, problems. So for assessment, um, we can do essentially very similar things to what we do for uh, language and motor speech disorders. So we can do a speech and language screening, just determining uh, if further assessment is needed. Uh, we can also do a hearing screening because we want to know if the hearing is impacting speech or the ability to hear speech. And then from there we can do a full assessment or instead of a screener we can do a full assessment. And that's where we get our case and our medical history. Um, we do an interview with the parent, the caregiver, and the patient. We do an oral MEC exam, which is what you did in class um, during the anatomy lecture to see if all of the structures are there and intact and if they're moving in the right way. Uh, we take a conversational speech sample and measure overall intelligibility. Uh, we do a standardized test for speech and language because we know that speech and language uh, can co-occur for disorders. And then we look at the errors and the patterns to determine if it's an articulation or a phonological disorder. Uh, and then in report writing, we look at our recommendations and our strategies. We also discuss if a child is stimulable, meaning during the session could we get them to produce the speech sound through different cues. And then we write our goals. And then during and after treatment, we measure for um, the treatment efficacy. So did the child meet their goals or do we need to continue uh, treatment? Uh, one thing we have to consider during assessments is our ethnoculture factors. So um, this is essentially just anything that Im can impact our speech production. Um, and it's something that is uh, more and more important um, as we move forward because we know that everyone produces uh, or has different rules for their language um, and not everything fits into our standard American English. Uh, and especially since we have more and more uh, immigrants into the country, we have to be able to realize the difference between a true disorder or just a um, speech sound production difference. Um, and then appropriately treating them uh, as, as it's determined. 
Now I know that this is a little bit longer of a lecture, but it's just because we're spending one class on this topic, um, and I wanted you to have all of that information when you come to class. So what I want you to do for class is to review all of the place, manner, and voicing for uh, articulation. We're going to watch some videos as well. Um, and really kind of piece and piece apart the difference between articulation and phonology. Um, so again, go through all of the slides for place manning and voicing of consonants, uh, and we'll do a chart in class um, and be familiar with articulation and phonology.